Hey, Jeff. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, 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 good to see you. Yeah, you as well. You as well. How have you been? Oh, I've been good. Uh, kind of, you know, slowing my business way down, so I'm just, just putz around a little bit now instead of doing all the work I was doing before. Trying to decide whether I'll kind of like the river. Yeah, hard to hard not to like a river. <laughs> I got one right here in the backyard. You do? Yeah, the gunpowder. That's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tailwater. It's a, it's a, it's one of the TU's 100, you know, best trout streams in the country. It's a small fish fishery, but, you know, I can go out there and get 30, 40 fish in a few hours, you know, swinging wets or, you know, if, if they're up, I can, you know, get them on top. But, yeah. Uh, it's a, but they're all wild browns and uh, it's, you know, it's a it's a nice little fish. You get occasional wild rainbow, but not too many. Yeah. So Jeff, you're the uh, you're the editor of a, a Fly Fusion magazine. Is that it? Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, among other things, or <laughs> among other things, I mean that's just like uh, you know a hobby. <laughs> okay. Right. Hey, can you see you can can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Hey, uh, try to do something. So I'm gonna use a uh, I'm gonna use a uh, technology called Pear Deck. Okay. Can you see if you can go to this website, joinpd.com? Okay. I'm going to have everybody do this. Join pd.com and then just type in that five digit code. Okay, let me. Um,
Let me pull up the All right. All right, cool. You made it on. Yeah, I'm not you there. See it? Might ask how you ask you how you're feeling today. <laughs> uh, uh, shit, I can't figure out how to get the hell back to. Uh, Back to the Zoom? No, I'm I'm in Zoom. I can't get get back to. Uh, I mean, I can't get back to Safari here to, to open that app. I don't know why. I'm full screen. Maybe I can go. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Shows you're logged in twice. I only, well, I, I shouldn't have. Um, oh, it's all right. It's all right. So do you see my screen? Uh, yep. Okay. When I do this, does it, is the screen changing? Yep. Cool. So this is a tech where um, we can have them do some voting. Right. Um, so right now you should see a voting, or uh, here you should see a green and red voting screen. Mm -hmm. Can you vote? Okay. We have a little poll at the end we want to do too. So, we'll, you know, okay. after you're okay. done, we, we'll just pull that up and do some stuff for our, our continuing education, so. Yeah, I was trying to make it interactive, so I've got, questions kind of throughout yep. here for, yeah.
think we're I think we're ready. Okay. We've got uh, how many people we got here already? Uh, we've got we got uh, you and I plus six at the moment. So of course it's only four. We got twelve minutes to go too. Uh, Mona Brewer's here and uh, Greg Buckley is here. David Drez is, he's attended both of the previous CE events. Tell me again what the DMAIC stands for, Jeff. Define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. Right. That's Six, six Sigma, isn't it? Right, yeah. Yeah. That's my fly tying area behind me there. Been tying, been tying lots of sock tackles lately. I see that. They're uh, they're deadly when when there's hatch activity going on on this river. I mean, yeah, this river uh, it, it's big enough that you can really you got lots of runs where you got nice geometry for swinging wets. You know, it doesn't work everywhere. It's uh, it's so the geometry on swinging wets is so important. Yeah, if you don't if you can't get it, you know, it, it's hard to do. But this river is big enough that you know sometimes you can go wade right down the middle of the riffle and fish to both sides. So what's your real job, Jeff? Uh, I run operations uh, for North America, uh, North American operations for a company called VF. So VF owns, uh, we own North Face, Timberland, uh, Vans, Eagle Creek, Jansport, Dickies, Smart Wool, Icebreaker. It's a $10 billion a year plus business. Oh, okay. um, so I, I run yeah, North America operations for one of the brands, Icebreaker, which is a natural performance wool um international clothing company mm -hmm. yeah. yep that's the current day job well, all i'm going to do is uh uh blow your uh you know blow your horn about you know having watched you make you know 105 110 foot cast with your five weight at a conclave a long time ago, and 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 that's all the uh, that's all the credentials I need to. <laughs> and if you're, I, I know you're still very. I'm sure you're still a very powerful caster. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, I don't. Are you? I guess I. I are you going to do some kind of an intro? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I, no, I'm just going to let you go, Jeff. I'm just okay. going to say, hey, hey, guys, uh, welcome, and you know, uh, uh, you know, we, we got a we got a real professional here to talk about power, you know, distance casting because I've watched them cast and okay. that you could just go. Cool. Yep, that sounds good. Good. And then uh, there's a couple points at the very end. Um, so like I said, I have these kind of interactive sessions that I'd like right. to do. We'll see how well they work, um, but we'll try. And then at the very end, um, I have a couple of scenarios set up and it's kind of the same thing where, um, you know, I have a student, it's a scenario and then to kind of fill out how they would approach it. Right. Um, we'll give them five minutes or so. And what I'd like to do is get a volunteer and allow them to share their responses. Obviously you'll need to unmute them and yep, I can choose somebody that, volunteers if we get a volunteer um but then to go through a couple of these Does that work 
Yeah, no, that sounds good. So everybody's going to have to log into uh, into. There it is. We're gonna we'll try it. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how that we'll see how that works, um, and then they can. Uh, you know, I don't know that there's much that they'll get from actually watching the Zoom. They can have it on to get the audio, um, and then can just follow along on Pear Deck. Um, if they want, which was where you'd logged in, and I will progress the slides. Um, but this is where they would vote from, right? So, am I seeing you on Zoom right now or Paranet? Uh, so you're seeing I'm sharing on Zoom. This is, uh, and this is the Pear Deck that you're in. Yeah, it looks like, it looks like I'm on Paranet. Yeah. Yeah. But they're going to see the same thing on Zoom, right? Yep, they'll, they'll see the same thing on Zoom. Okay. The only thing on Zoom is they just won't be able to vote. And that's why I'd like them to be in, just to add something to it, right? And add another dimension yep. and some yep. interactivity. Yeah. What kind of impact has the, uh, the COVID thing had on, on your business or your work? Well, uh, pretty dramatic. I mean, we, uh, we've got about 750 retail stores in North America and, um, yeah, they're all closed, obviously. Um, yep. wholesale is also not doing well. And, so we're basically just left with e-com business. E-com is actually doing really well. Our e-commerce business is up um, really well, but it's a, it's a pretty well managed company. So we haven't had to do any layoffs or anything like that, but it's been right. very long days and lots of hours <laughs> trying to manage, you know, manage supply out of multiple countries and, right. you know, all of that. So it's been a lot. And Icebreaker is a new brand for us. We just acquired them about a year ago. So I've been managing kind of the transition onto our new platform. And, um, you know, <laughs> I think managing a, a newly acquired brand with a brand new team that I just hired, closing the Vancouver office and bringing people to Denver during a pandemic is not, and all remotely, um, is not a, uh, not something I ever thought I'd have to do, but it's been a good learning experience for sure. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So, yeah we're all learning uh, this. I uh, only wish I had bought stock in Zoom about two months ago. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Fortunately, I did have some Clorox, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm riding high on that, but, uh, you know, that, that's about the only one. You said you did buy Clorox? Well, I had it. I already had it. Yeah. Oh, you did? So it, yeah, it's the only thing in, well, about the only thing in my portfolio that's it's up. <laughs> we had, we had a pile of people signed up, you know, like 85. You know unless they're all going to sign in here at the last possible second. Um, we've only got, uh, well, we got 15 up now, 15 attendees, 18. Kind of weird. I guess they're all signing in late here. All right, we'll be back in just a second.
Okay. Seven. Eight. Nine. We've got about thirty there now. Cool. Usually it takes people a little bit to log into a new. Right, you're gonna to have to show them that uh, that code again too. So yeah, yeah, no problem. I'll walk them through. Well, it. A, yeah, I think as a first order of business, go ahead and ask everybody to log into that site so that they can yep. be interact with you. Yeah, um, totally agree. Having been a naval officer, it's uh, you know we'd have been underway, you know, a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how long we're in the navy. I'll, we'll, we'll cut people a little slack here. Yeah, we'll give them a couple minutes. I mean, if you want to kick it off, I can start kind of chatting and yeah. Um, and I'll do that. Uh, yeah. Well, we still have a lot of people, lot of people signing in. Uh, we have about 35 people signed up so far or, or joined. And uh, I want to welcome everybody to this particular uh, CE uh, Zoom event. Uh, our, our presenter tonight uh, is uh, Jeff Wagner. Uh, you can see in distance casting and having watched Jeff cast, uh, we have the right person to have this discussion with. So, uh, so uh, Jeff wants everybody to uh, sign into another website so we can go interactive and uh, and he'll go ahead and give you that that website and the code to log into uh, you can you'll you'll see the same stuff on zoom you just won't be able to interact with with him uh, we, we can probably do some Q and A's later but uh, be better if you uh, log into uh, into this uh, pair deck site that he's going to give you the information on so Jeff, why don't you go ahead and show everybody the, uh, the, uh, the, the website and the code to log into. Okay. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Phil. Um, all right, everybody. So um, before we kind of get going, 
Um, I see some messages up, Phil, if you want to check those and just make sure everybody's able to get in. So um, before we get up and running, um, if you can all go to joinpd.com and put in this five digit code, that would be great. Uh, this is called Pear Deck. It's a software that I'll be using that's kind of interactive, that allows some voting and interaction um, during the presentation and, and um, you know, allow us to, to interact while, you know, not everybody, everybody will be muted. So it's joinpd.com. So what I'd recommend is one tab with your Zoom open, another tab on your web browser with joinpd.com open. And when you open it, when you, after you get to joinpd.com, you can type in the C-U-A-O-V, this code, and you should see this same thing. We'll give everybody a minute to do that. All right, I'm seeing people get on seven, eight, nine. There we go. You're finding it. <laughs> Good. This will be kind of fun. This is a so my wife is a, a teacher, fifth grade, and um, she uses the same software. So she's obviously teaching remotely also in the coronavirus. And this is the software actually she's been using with her students um, and kind of gives some interactivity while they're all remote. So she's been teaching fifth grade remote and using this as well. And it's been pretty cool. So we'll just have some fun with it. And um, yeah, looks like we've got about 20 or so people Let's give you another minute or so here and then we'll get going. So joinpd.com and then type in, looks like everybody's finding it. Now, when you get there, you should see this. And um, what'll happen is you don't have to be on the Zoom now and I will have control of your screen and can progress your slides. So, what you'll see when we get further along is you'll get to a screen that looks like this. And on the Pear Deck slide is where you'd enter in some information. I'll ask you a question, you enter it in here. Nobody else will be able to see it except for me unless I show them. So you have to be on the Pear Deck slide to do that, um, but we'll get there. So let me go back and see how many we have. Good, okay, I think we've got pretty much everybody, a few more people still logging in, but we'll, we'll go ahead and get going. Um, so I'm seeing about 30 people, there's a few more. I'm gonna pop up the Pear Deck one more time. Joinpd.com, C-U-A-O-B. And uh, Phil, if people end up showing up late, we can just email it to them or um, put it into the chat box also. Okay. All right. So uh, we'll go ahead and get going. So continuing education series, um, love doing these, really love working with um, students and instructors. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit of background on myself before we go into this. Um, so I probably know a few of you, maybe I don't know some of you, but um, Jeff Wagner, I've been, um, so let me just give you kind of current what I do professionally. So I work for VF Corporation. Uh, if you don't know, VF is kind of the parent company, holding company for North Face, Timberland, Vans, Eagle Creek, Jansport, Icebreaker, Smart Wool, and I run North America operations for Icebreaker. Um, and so it's kind of my day job. Um, from a fly fishing standpoint, I got started with the CICP a long time ago. So um, I think the first time I actually um, tried for my test was in 1998. And I think I got certified in 2000 on my CI and 2004 in my NCI. Um, and I can truly attest for, you know, meeting tons and tons of great people. I don't, probably, I don't even know if Phil remembers how long ago he and I met, but it's been a long time ago. Long time. Yeah, <laughs> long time. So 
Um, love doing this, love interacting. I also served on the Board of Governors and Board of Directors for a period of time with the, with the CICT. So 20 plus years with, uh, with the FFI. Um, this topic to me is one that I have uh, kind of worked on for a while um, and we'll get into it a little bit here. Um, the goal of what we're going to talk about tonight is really to help fly casting educators utilize a consistent framework for teaching. So when we think about teaching, when I think about how um, people often organize their plans, I've often found that it's very um, sporadic, right? It's not a consistent methodology. And so we'll get into what it means in a little bit, but um, we're going to use this kind of consistent framework that I'm going to show you and we're going to apply it to kind of a distance efficiency and power thing. Um, that's what I like to do and many of you probably know that. Um, so we're going to move first to this first Pear Deck piece. So on Pear Deck right now you should see this question. Type two things you already know about today's topic. How do you create a learning plan for a student? So if you want, type something in. One, this will help you kind of think about what do you already know about how to create a lesson plan? And I'm thinking about long-term lesson planning, how you work with a student and actually create a learning plan for them from beginning to end. So we'll give you just a minute or so. We'll start moving through these pretty quick. There's only a couple of them that actually ask for the information. The other thing that'll do is I can save this off and use it for um, future reference also as we kind of learn and adapt as we're doing these so that we can gain some additional information. So it doesn't have to be a lot, just type in a couple of words. Um, I'm gonna move us to the next one. So it's how confident do you feel in creating long-term lesson plans for your student? So here you should see a little blue icon and drag it wherever you want. Green obviously is, hey, I feel awesome. I'm great at doing this. I shouldn't even be here. And red is, man, not good at all. Need a lot of help. Just grabbing the blue dot, moving it around. Whoa, there's a lot of people that shouldn't be here. So this is where I love kind of the interactive pieces because it can kind of help us talk about, um, you know, where we should be and, and how advanced we should be. So the question was, how, how confident do you feel? You can see everybody's blue dots kind of being moved around again. Green is, you know what, I feel super confident in doing this. A lot of people kind of in the middle and a few on the right side. So we're going to keep moving forward. Great. Thanks for that. Um, so if there are certain things that you want as we go forward, if you can type those in the what you kind of hope to learn piece uh, in the comments, Phil can take those and we can just make sure at the end that, uh, that anything that we wanted to talk about or you wanted to learn, um, we made sure that we talked about. It. All right, so we'll get into the heart of it. Phil, are we good to go? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Um, uh, the kind of the premise behind this is, as I mentioned, I'm in operations and, and have been for a lot of years. Um, a lot of my background is very operationally driven um, and a lot of it has been process improvement. And so many of you are probably familiar with Lean Six Sigma or Lean Sigma or whatever those things are. And the, the, one of the primary frameworks that's used in that is this define, measure, analyze, improve and control, so DMAIC. And as I was going through this, um, to me, it ended up being a great framework for us to be able to put together lessons for students. So, I, you know what, we're all teachers here. Everybody's got a way that they need to do it. And it's continuing education. It's not, in my mind, this isn't supposed to be teaching you how to do something, or you probably shouldn't be a CI. This is, this is more getting little bits and pieces that helps you get better at what you already do, right? We're already professionals here. We already know what we're doing. Many of us have been teaching for many, year, many years. So my hope in showing you this is maybe to think about some different things that you can learn and take away. So this define, measure, analyze, improve, control is a process improvement. So you take a process, you define what the problem is, you measure, take measurements around the problem, 
you analyze what's going on, and then you come up with an improved plan, um, and then you figure out a way to control it. And for me, when I think about teaching a student or really anything, right, it's the same thing. Um, it's always a process, and how do you teach a student? And so I adapted that define, measure, analyze, improve, control into define being what does your student do? What do they want to do? Um, what's their goal? And we'll talk about that in more detail. What can they do? It's actually measuring what they do today and um, putting something on paper so that we understand what that looks like. The analyze is doing is the what do they do? Um, what are they doing today, right? How does it look? What are the mistakes that they're making? What are the ways that we can help them improve? And they approve then is the actual teaching part of it. It's what should they do? And then how do we keep them doing it? It's kind of a practice plan. It's how do we keep them from going back to those bad habits? So it's define, measure, analyze, improve, control. What do you want? What do they want? What do they want to do? What can they do? What do they do? What should they do? And how do they keep doing it? So like I said, this is the process improvement approach. Many of you are probably familiar with it. We're running a little short on time, so I'm not going to go through a lot of this, but um, very heavily you know, in the automotive industry, part of the Lean Six Sigma. Um, it's really just applying the scientific method, um, a problem solving approach to teaching. So we'll get into the define piece. What do they want to do? So I have that underlined for a reason. So the define phase is really about determining your customer needs. And I, I feel like this to me is a pretty big gap um, when we start talking about students. So in students in this kind of phase, I'm not thinking about students that are, um, you know, you have five minutes to work with or 10 minutes. This is a casting student that comes to you and says, hey, I'm, I'm headed on a saltwater trip and I really want to get better at X. And I have three months I have four months, I have whatever, I'm getting ready for the CI test, right? That might be another one. I have three months, I have six months, whatever it might be, how do I get better? So it's, this phase is de determining the customer's needs and I always apply the customer to our student. It's about asking open-ended questions and building relationships and it's really about um, the root cause of what they wanna learn and I have Find the Moose, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but when I have um, determine the customer needs, I think the biggest thing that you can do is ask you these open-ended questions that really help you understand um, why do they want to do what they want to do. So to me, this is the most important step. Um, you know, we're all about relationships and about people. And so coming in with uh, a very relationship-oriented approach that allows you to get to know the student, uh, understand what they want, um, and learn more about them. And I think that obviously then gives us just clues into how to teach a student, um, you know, if they're into music or if they're into sports or if they're in, you know, if they have been conventional fishing, whatever it might be, everything you learn about that student are things you can apply to your teaching. And one of the big things is what are they aspiring to? Is it something that they're just going to take and, and just um, use once because they're headed on a trip? Um, with work maybe or something like that and they just need to learn how to throw 30 feet because it's just this work thing they've got to do or is it really something much deeper than that that they you know their son fly fishes and they really want to connect with their son on a deeper level and or their daughter on a deeper level and and so they're learning to fish um, I put a lot of emphasis into this piece of it and this came from my years of guiding um, when you know we would spend that car ride to the river or whatever it might be learning about that that student that customer not only does it create repeat business when we think about, um, you know, trying to get customers to come back, and especially if you're using the CI as, a, as kind of a business or a, a professional aspiration. Um, so I think it's super critical that um, we get to this point. So our next kind of interaction are, um, what are some questions you could ask your students um, to understand what they, re what they really want to learn? So right now you should be on this slide. You don't have to put in all three. Just put in a, one question on what's a probing question that maybe would um, help bring out a good genuine response. Give you a minute to kind of think about it, plug something in. And what I really like about this question is um, what's a way that you can start asking questions that get to the heart that are open-ended um, without putting in presuppositions or without getting people to be, you know, uh, off on something, right? 
no bias. All right. We will keep going. So um, I have a couple of things repeated in here, right? But the goal is to hear from them. And, and I have this repeated, obviously, multiple times that your opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion doesn't matter. Your opinion doesn't matter. Um, again, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on this defined phase, but it really isn't about you. Um, you know, and the customer's coming to you. Um, I'm, I'm, this might be a little bit extreme, but they don't really care about you. They, they're there for, for them and to learn something from them and don't want to hear about what you've done and where you've been and all the places you've fished and how great you are. They want to be taught a skill. And so this is an opportunity to hear from them. And what have they done? And where have they been? Um, what do they hope to accomplish? What are they, uh, why do they want to achieve the goal? When do you hope to have um, the new skill and putting everything together in the kind of a, of a learning plan? So the relationship, opportunity to connect with the customer, have empathy, take interest, understand who they are and why they want to do whatever it is that they want to do. So while we're doing this, I'm going to take you to a, a little bit of a lesson plan that I use. So you should now be seeing um, an Excel spreadsheet. And, um, I, you know, I'll tell you that um, for me, a lot of this is I'm not trying to be super um, regimented or, or um, defined in, in how we do everything, but I do like to keep records. And I'm sure everybody's got a different way to do things. But for me, this kind of demaic approach allows us to um, kind of keep track of, of where we're at, um, the date of where we're at. So for me, I just put in what the lesson plan is, who the student is, when we start meeting, um, and then for the defined phase. What's the date of the defined phase? Um, and any notes, right? What, what is their goal? And, and just to write it down, make sure I've got a record of it. I can go back to it. I can understand what it is um, and make sure that we're um, you know, <clears throat> keeping that at the heart of whatever it is that they want to do. You can see here I have goals to learn to cast further, to combat the wind, to fish saltwater effectively, and catch your first permit whatever that might be. So that is um, how I kind of fill this out and you'll see that in a little bit more detail as we get along here. All right, so um, my first question for you, so please answer this one, just true or false, click on one or the other, choose an option in the defined phase you are critiquing your student. True or false? Give you a minute. So we're almost done with this first section, Phil, to find any feedback from the comments, any people can't hear, see anything else that we need to talk about. Nope, I'm gonna assume we're good. All right, so we don't have everybody responding. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, so kind of mixed responses, right, of the almost 20 people that responded, majority said false. My answer would have been false. Um, that when you're in the define phase, it's really about trying to understand the student, right? When we're in this phase of defining, we really want to understand um, about them. Now, at the same time, I can understand why people might say yes, because you're always observing them and understanding what they're saying. Um, and, I, and I can agree with that as well, right? You're going to be catching what the student's going to be doing and you're going to be seeing them. I just would make sure that it's not the focus. And to me, um, you know, I often hear people talking about multitasking. I don't believe multitasking is a real thing. Most of the evidence and studies you read anymore say that multitasking isn't a real thing. Um, you can only do one thing. If you do two things at once, um, you're probably doing two things not as well as if you were doing one thing. So you can do one thing well or two things partially. And I kind of feel like that's the same way with this. If you're intensively kind of working with the student, understanding them, asking them questions, having a good conversation, but you're also trying to watch what's going on with their loops, they're probably going to be seeing that. And especially for you as an instructor, could potentially take away from that interaction and, and maybe even intimidate. So just keep that in mind, but understand the, the impact also of that um, always observing. So the next phase of this is what can they do? And this is actually a measurement phase. So um, I believe that this is 
um, other than learning about them, right, it's, it's really critical to make sure that um, we're measuring what the customer wants. It matches the defined phase. So um, here, if they say that they want to learn how to distance gaps, for example, that you're going to measure their distance. So I'm going to use the example of a student that wants to come in and cast 120 feet, 100 feet, 100 feet, whatever it might be. They want to cast a long ways. The best thing you can do then is measure that first distance cast or measure multiple distance casts. Come out with their equipment, put out a tape, kind of in an unintimidating environment, have them throw a couple of distance casts and measure each one of them. And this is where I would go back to this sheet and you can see I've got some dates plugged in and I have the element that they have and then I have a few distance measurements that we've actually scored. Plug these in. Um, and then you can put in some notes if you want to at this point. But again, this point is about measurement. You're going to be doing some observation and hearing what's going on and that kind of thing. But making sure that we're tracking it. Now you can have multiple measurements in one day or you can see these dates. It's also for us a, a way for us to track the progress over time. So maybe on the first day of May 11th, I might come in here um, and maybe have a couple of measurements so that we have a good uh, data set, right? And maybe one of them was 89 and one of them's 80 feet. Um, and so we have a couple of measurements and then we can measure over time and see where the progress is. So not all of your students are going to be, you know, as interested in, um, uh, in that kind of quantitative analysis. But I think it's a great way to go back to the student and say, hey, over five courses, five lessons, especially if they feel like they're not making much progress, you can go back and say, well, you know, we started out at 40 feet and now you're throwing 52 feet and it may not feel like you're making as much progress, but hey, here's the evidence, right? Here's how you're improving. Um, so I think it's a great way to make sure that you're showing that. Um, and then, like I said, it gives you and your students a point of reference, updated each lesson plan, um, and you measure what they want, make it quantifiable, it's distance, accuracy, carry, and just for a couple of tips here, um, so for me, one of them could be distance casting, right? Actually measuring the length that they're distance casting. Could be accuracy, laying out an accuracy course and seeing how many targets they hit. Could be their carry, their max carry. So if we're talking distance casting, how much line can I actually carry in the air with good loops uh, or before it starts to fall? Um, you know, I have done speed before with a, a couple of different techniques. So measuring what they want um, and making sure that you're measuring against that. So my next question for you, can a measure be qualitative? So you should be seeing the screen, true or false, can a measure be qualitative or does it have to be quantitative? Hey, hey Jeff, yep. while, I, while we have a break here, one of the guys from Australia wants that site again. Uh, I've, got the, I've got the code, but what's the site he needs to log into? Uh, yeah, I can just pull it up. Right there, joinpd.com. Uh, joinpd, yeah, okay. Joinpd.com oh, oh, and then C-U-A-O-B. He's chatting, he's chatting with me. I'll probably just put it in the comments. Yeah, yeah, you probably just put it in the comments for anybody else. So can a measure be qualitative? So quantitative is, right, everybody knows quantitative is. To make a cast, it's 80 feet, it's 90 feet, it's some kind of a, a measurement. Can it be qualitative? So again, a uh, few people responding. We'll let it continue to kind of trickle in here. I won't show you the answers yet in case you disagree, but put in your answers. I wonder if you can change your answers. I don't know. Somebody should try to vote more than once. Can it be qualitative? So um, looks like if everybody responding, some true, some false. Oh, it looks like you can change. <laughs> awesome. So um, this is fun. It's fun to see kind of the live results. Um, can it be qualitative? True. I 100% agree with that. You know, everything I talked about prior was this distance, accuracy, carry, speed, that kind of thing. Um, those, are, those are obviously very, very quantitative, and I think those are good things to have. Can it be qualitative? Absolutely. Um, I think my last bullet on here is, it's, I think it's often a how they feel about it, right? It's a confidence. And for me, I often use this if it's uh, in the wind or if they're carrying a certain amount or fishing from a boat, things like that, absolutely can be qualitative. Um, and in fact, that's probably can be even a better measurement sometimes than, than uh, quantitative, right? That they may, maybe they're not gaining in distance, but maybe they're, 
their comfort level with getting to 50 feet or 60 feet is better, it's easier. So it aligns with the hopes of what they want to achieve. Um, you kind of decide what to measure, right? The student's giving you this problem. They're telling you what it is that they want to achieve, want to achieve in the define phase. You're coming up with a good way to measure it. And it can be more than one thing. And in fact, I would often say you probably should have a couple of things to measure. Um, so one of them probably should be a qualitative. It's, you know, how do you feel today? On a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling about, about your casting today? Um, you know, I think that's a, a great way to, um, to kind of keep record of how they feel about their progress and then to measure distance and then to maybe measure something else like their ability to shoot or their ability to do something else. And I think multiple points of measurement are good and it's a great way to just check in, right? Um, you've already done your defined phase, you've chatted, you've done your measurements, and now once you get into the lesson plans, you can come back and say each, before you start each lesson, hey, how do you feel about distance casting? How have you felt about your practice? Measure it on kind of a one to 10 scale, track it over time, um, come up, do your distance casting before each lesson, do whatever, get your measurements down, and then go into the lesson, and we'll talk to them. Um, again, just a little bit more on this measurement piece, but where are you starting from? How are, how are we doing, right? I think, you know, a big piece here isn't necessarily the student, and I'll talk about this more, but I don't believe that there isn't a bad student. Um, <laughs> some of us maybe feel that way sometimes. I think feel sometimes I've felt like the bad student not being able to learn something, but I really don't believe that's the case. I think it's how good of an instructor are you, and if you're not getting it, it's probably not probably, it is because you're doing something wrong, not because the student is doing something wrong. So this is really a check-in on how are we doing. And I think it's a, the measure piece is great because at the end of, beginning of each lesson, we can come in and say, um, you know, how are you feeling about it? And, you know, if they're at a three and it's not getting any better after three lessons, it's, well, you probably should have done it after lesson two, but it's a great check-in point for you to say, man, I've kind of been doing this certain thing and they're still not feeling better about it. What else can I do? What's another teaching technique? So it's as much for you as it is for the student. Um, the other thing is when will we get there? And when you start seeing the progress and you're charting it over time, you know, if you have a student that throws 120 feet, um, wants to throw 120 feet and they come into you at throwing 40 feet, we know that we have to make up a gap of 80 feet. And for some people that, that might almost be insurmountable. Um, but at the same time, if it's a, you know, if it's a, a person that really is adept and just learning, it may not be. And so I think after the first couple of lesson, lessons, you're charting the progress. If they go from 40 feet and you taught them to haul and now they're at 60 feet, you taught them to shoot a little bit. Now they're at 70 feet, maybe getting to that plus hundred, um, is a shorter period of time. So it helps you kind of track your progress and create some kind of a dashboard. Again, if I go back to this, if you're a, a data guy like me, uh, data person like me, this helps you kind of create a, a dashboard, if you will, right? It gives you some pieces you can kind of go over with the student and say, hey, you know, we met on the 11th and you first threw 89 feet. Now it's the 18th, you're throwing 91 feet. If we put in some kind of a qualitative piece here, um, right, it'd be a, a great way for you to say, well, you know, you started out at a three and now you're feeling more confident, you're at a four, something like that. So it's, a, it's kind of a dashboard piece as well. All right, we'll keep moving. Um, I have here measure at the beginning and end, end of each lesson. I at least do the check-in at each one of them. Um, doesn't have to be formal or announced. You can just kind of do it. Sometimes it's easier to have the student out casting and just measure um, without them really knowing. Sometimes I might get nervous. Um, and then um, again, like I said, how are you doing? Um, and my last statement here, I think is really critical as instructors. And I believe this, and I believe this with my kids too. And um, with the people I work with as a manager, that the question isn't whether or not your student or your person can learn to cast, it's whether or not you can teach them to cast. Um, and I think that's uh, really relevant to this. And I think that's the beauty behind this kind of model is you start out with a defined phase. What do they want to learn? You're measuring it, you're tracking the progress and it gives you a lot of feedback. So next question, as you measure, should you make comments comparing this student's, it should be this student to others? Quick question, answer as fast as you can. Don't change your answers. As you measure, should you make comments comparing this student to others? 
should put a little clock up in the corner. Give you 10 more seconds. Five, three, two, one. False. Totally agree. I think the um, I think the big thing here is, and well, the reason why I would say it's false um, is it's not about comparing, right? You don't want to talk about a student that can cast forty. You know that you well, you had this other student that could throw one hundred and twenty feet. Man, they were awesome, and they made it look so easy. While this student's trying to throw forty, that's a poor one. Um, on the flip side, sometimes it's um, I think it, you you can have a a desire to say, well, you know, I had this other student that been fishing for 30 years and they could only cast 30 feet and you're doing it after day one and you know you can cast 40 feet my my hesitancy with that would be one you're talking about another student and i believe kind of in client student privilege two um, i think it's you don't know if they might know that other student right they found out about you from somewhere so just in general don't compare them to others i think maybe to compare to a general population might be one thing um, but in general, don't ever make comparisons to other students. All right, so we've gone through define, we've gone through measure, we're running behind. I'm going to try to move through this a little bit quicker. Um, this was supposed to be kind of fast, but uh, so analyze. So the analyze phase is really now the first time that we're going to go in and actually see what they're doing. We're going to watch, we're going to listen. We're not judging. This is just wa ra watching and listening, right? So the find phase is you asking questions, it's engaging with the customer, it's showing them empathy finding out what they want to do, hearing about them, learning a little bit about their life story. The measurement piece is watching them cast a little bit, making some, and the analyze phase now is um, actually seeing what they do. So we've directed our attention from the student to kind of their casting, how they can cast, to now actually analyzing what they're doing. Our focus is there. So we're watching and listening, we're not judging, we're taking notes, and we're being very specific um, about this. And the most important thing here is actually creating some kind of a diagnosis. It's not just that they have a tailing loop, it's trying to look at why they have a uh, tailing loop, right? We're watching, we're listening, we're not judging, we're taking notes and we're asking some questions. So you're allowing the student to cast, give them some breathing room. I like, you know, often to do this just kind of as conversational, um, kind of the way that we might even start a CI exam, right? Where you have the student casting and they're out in front. Um, and while they don't even really know that you're fully analyzing, you're kind of watching what they're doing and say, hey, you know, throw, throw a big cast. Let's see how far you can go. I'm watching everything that's happening in kind of an unintimidating environment. Give them some breathing room and ask about it a lot of questions. What are you doing with your left hand? What are you thinking about? Or what are you doing with your right hand? And do you notice any of this? And, um, but try not to teach at this point, right? This is really about hearing from the student, understanding what they have going on. Um, you're the expert. Don't intimidate them, right? They're probably already intimidated. Watch the body language. If you notice people are getting nervous, um, watch what you say, uh, you know, about things. You're not there to, um, at this point, to say, you know, oh, that didn't look good or that looked great. You're just, you're just observing and, uh, and taking notes. This is the keeping the record sheet piece of it, and I can't even go back to write this, this uh, tab. So again, these are a few more data points for you, right? And measurements um, on the analyze phase, and, and to get a few more data points, keep a date and a record of it. Remember, it's not a CI exam. They're not there to, you know, could be actually, but it's not. They're there to learn um, and uh, make your notes clear as well. So align with define and measure. Um, may need to redefine or go back. So, you know, if they said that they want to do X and you're seeing that it's not going to be possible, you might want to go back and, and have a conversation again about what the, what they actually are wanting out about it. The big thing here, I think, is once you have the define, the measure, and the analyze piece is to actually sit down and get some agreement on it and make sure that everybody's on the same page. You and the student uh, agree, right? Hey, I want to throw 100 feet of line because I really feel like I need to do that in order over the salt. That's what they tell you. And then uh, in, the, um, in the measurement piece, you can see they can throw 40 feet. You look at it, you see that they're throwing some tailing loops. You've got some things going on. Sit down. Hey, I saw some tailing loops. We'll talk about it. We'll get to that in a minute. Use your tools here. I think one thing that's, that's really critical is to make sure that the student can see what's going on. And this is a whole other conversation. And 
think I wrote an article on using Coach's Eye a couple issues ago in Fly Fisher Magazine. Um, if I didn't mention, I write for Fly Fusion and Fly Fisher Magazine as Fly Casting Field Editor. Um, use Coach's Eye. Coach's Eye is an amazing tool. Been using it for years and uh, again, kind of wrote an article on it. Um, we could have a whole other session on that and maybe comment to Phil if you want us to do a, a session on digital teaching tools, but Coach's Eye is a great one. Give them a way where you can see it and they can see what's happening and it's not just your word. Again, kind of combining that visual, some auditory pieces and, and how they're seeing. So in the analyze phase, next question, we're gonna give you 30 seconds. In the analyze phase, it is important to find as many errors as possible, true or false. While you're doing that, Phil, I'm gonna check in with you and see if there's any issues, comments. No, we got a few uh, chats that I'm answering. Uh, a couple of people missed the code, and uh, okay. So no, it's uh, it seems to be going fine. Okay, great. We'll give you a few more seconds here. Analyze phase. It, it is important to find as many errors as possible. Give you ten more seconds. Three, what do we say? True, kind of interesting. Some false, some true, mostly false, right? 75% false, some true. Uh, that's pretty interesting uh, to me. In the analyze phase, is important. it is important to find as many errors as possible. I would say here that th that is false. Um, now, I could go both ways. I could totally see the true piece where you know, you're trying to observe as much as possible and get as many things down on paper as you possibly can. And then you'll pick out the ones that are really making being the most important. And that's kind of what I was thinking about here and why I would have said false is that what I'm looking for are those couple of really big key nuggets that I know are going to fill our time in the next few lessons. And the reason why I say that if you collect a whole every single thing, one, you can have a tendency to overcorrect and add too many things. Two, after you start working on thing one or two that are probably the most important, um, thing three, four, and five may change. I think we've all seen that happen, right? You correct one thing and something else may happen. So to me here, this analyze phase is really about collecting the ones that are causing the biggest problems. Are they creeping? Um, what's the root cause of whatever they're doing, right? Um, and mark those down. So again, if I kind of go back to my sheet here, now I'm on my analyze phase and I see that the elements that I'm now tracking are there's some creep, there's some tails. I put in some more information here, right? Okay, if I'm seeing the tails, I'm gonna know that it's most likely coming from the creep. Keeping record of it, what's the date, what's the thing you're seeing, what's the notes that you're gonna put down on it, that um, you know, the creep is, you know, aggressive creep, shortening stroke, right, whatever it may be. So putting in some notes. Good one. All right, find, measure, analyze. So far we have done no teaching. <laughs> and, and I know that's a lot. And sometimes that can even be uh, just the first lesson. I personally wouldn't recommend it being the first lesson. Uh, to me, the define is often over the phone when you're talking to them, trying to figure out what the lesson is. The first lesson might be the measure um, and the analyze, or the first time you get together might be the measure and analyze. Maybe you don't even charge for that one. It's just the measure and analyze. The improve is when we finally start improving. Now, um, before we get into this, this is now you are teaching. Um, I want to go back here to this piece. And this is where we take the things that were in the analyze and we bring them into the improve phase, right? So we said they had a creep. What you want to put in now to your actual lesson plan is what's causing the creep, right? Well, we're going to ask them to lengthen their stroke. Um, they need to increase their stroke length. The way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to tell them to drift in the back cast. Maybe some of you don't like that. I love that. I think it's one of the greatest things you can do. So it's a distance student. They're coming forward a little bit. They're creeping and then they make their casting stroke, right? So now we're going to ask them to stop and drift. I want that in here. I want that in the improve phase because this is going to kind of define what our first lesson is going to look like. 
The other thing that you'll see is um, a couple other things like a smooth application of power, don't overpower. Um, and um, uh, at the end of the stroke, and we can talk about a couple of other things. In here would be practice techniques. Um, we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, some of these are gonna be kind of specific, but we take the analyze, we take the failure, the thing that's causing an issue, we put in what we're gonna try to solve for, we put in the thing we want them to improve, and then some of the practice techniques. And so to me, a mirror is I'm having them cast at a mirror so they don't have to turn around and look at their back cast. They're actually mirrors in front of me or just like I'm seeing in this video here, right? I can actually see where my hand goes. So if I'm in a mirror, I can see my hand do this and I won't do that. I can work on my tracking, right? It's also a great way to do it if you're doing video techniques with your students. So now I'm casting into the camera. You can see where my back cast goes and see where my forward cast goes, right? So kind of like in a mirror. Um, I might ask them to stretch, right? So we know that for a lot of distance students, one of the big things is they kind of run into that body block where they, right here is where they stop. I'm going to change my camera. Hold on a second. So my arm doesn't disappear. I'm in my office. So I'm going to make my back cast so that my arm doesn't disappear, right? Um, right. So to stretch. So this is often a, a body block. It's a point where you stop. And so often, you know, actually stretching out, right? Working on some flexibility and range of motion in the shoulder, those kind of things. Anyway, you're putting down the lesson plan uh, of the things that we want them to work on. Um, uh, I've got this in the slide deck. I can send it to anybody that wants it. Um, but this is really some of the things that I would have them do that um, for distance that are specific, <clears throat> excuse me, specific practice techniques. Turn on a light. Okay, moving on. Now you're actually teaching. So improved phase should focus on one item at a time. So you put down all the stuff. Many of you said, I'm gonna to try to find as many things as I should find a, that are wrong as possible. Now that you're actually teaching, how many things should you focus on at one time? If you saw they had a, uh, they were creeping and they were also using too short of a haul and they were also dropping the rod in the back cast. Should you fix all those at the same time or not? Give you a couple of seconds here. Give you 10 more. Are you seeing the chat questions, Jeff? Uh, I haven't been looking at them, Bill. Okay, I'm 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 uh, answering them. Okay, I'm in there. Okay, or giving my two cents worth at least. You know. Great. True. Yes, agree. Totally agree. It should be one thing at a time. Um, yeah. I think everybody here is you know kind of on that same page and making sure that we focus on one error at a time. I think there's a few rare exceptions where maybe that's not true, but um, yeah, good. So, um, like I said, I can send these out. I know that part of this said that it was on distance, efficiency, and power. And these are just some practice drills that I use with my students. Um, when I think about what I'm wanting a student to improve, right, that we're wanting them to not uh, rotate in the back cast, right? If they're trying to throw a long distance cast, we need them to have, stay, keep their hand in the same plane in the back cast. So I may not want them to use a, I may want them to use a camera or a, a excuse me, a mirror right here. Um, but the other thing that I might want them to do, maybe they're overpowering the rod. You can see the third one down is less power. It's always too much. So it's actually going out in a field, um, right, and making a cast and using as little energy as possible. So maybe they're powering like this, and now I'm going to have them use less power, less power, less power, less power. And to me, that would actually be a practice technique that I'd want them to do in their own practice sessions, right? These are things, these are drills that we'd want them to do to reinforce what we're teaching. Um, so less power, max carry might be another one, right? Where um, we're wanting to carry as much line as they can. And so, you know, we'll get it to 50 feet and find out where that point is. Go out each casting session when they go out and practice on their own, you're trying to add a little bit more. Again, not that you're going to ever be out 
false casting the 80 feet of line or something like that. But learning how to false cast at 80 feet will just help you control 30 or 40 feet all the better. So these are just some practice techniques that I try to give the students so that they're reinforcing in their practice drills. All right, so the next piece to control how they keep doing it. So um, this is kind of the final exam piece. So really there's not much in the control other than it's just a continuation of what we're talking about, right? To me, this is going back and looking at our notes. What did they define? What's our measurements? How are we improving? And how are they progressing? Are we continuing to see progress? Are they getting rid of that creep? Um, and are the practice techniques that we're giving them are they working? How they keep doing it? So um, maybe we need to give them different practice techniques, but the control is making sure that they're continuing to do the same thing, that those old errors aren't entering back in, um, and any new ones that are popping up are, are being taken care of. So that's the control. So the next piece that we had here, I call it a final exam, but um, it's actually a little bit more interactive. And I know we have a big group, but what I'd like to do is for, for present you with a um, student scenario. Um, I have three of them. I'm gonna kind of give you the student scenario and um, have you fill out this chart. So the define piece is, find to me what the problem, um, what they're wanting. The measure piece is what would you measure? The analyze piece is what are you seeing? And the improve is how would you actually help them? So I will give you the student scenario. Now, the one thing about this that I'm gonna show you um, is earlier I talked about the moose. And um, years ago, I was guiding and working at a fly shop um, for Don Davis. Maybe, maybe some of you knew Don Davis in Loveland, Colorado. And um, Don died of a heart attack years ago. But one of the things he always told us when we were um, doing guiding um, was before he had a student was you always ask him, you know, what do you wanna to do today? And they'd say, oh, I wanna catch a fish. But there was always something deeper than that that they really wanted, right? They were there with their son. They wanted to connect with their son. or They wanted to do something. So I think, I don't know if that's always the case, but I think often that is the case. So especially on these big saltwater trips that people are spending thousands of dollars for, and I think they often, I don't know about you, but I often get these um, customers that that's what they're wanting, right? I'm doing classes for people that are going on their first saltwater trip, they're going with their husband or their wife, or they're going with a group of girls, or they're doing something. And often they say, well, I just want to cast further. I just want to, but usually there's something underneath that. There's something like, well, I don't want to be embarrassed, or I want to cast further than my friend, or I want to cast further than my husband, or I want to catch more fish, or there's something usually a little bit deeper. And so that's what I call the moose. Um, let's find the moose. So um, let me walk you through this scenario, and then we'll go into it. So you're a retired doctor from Montana with lots of money and lots of pride. You want to catch fish and not be embarrassed. You're hiring an instructor for them to tell you what to do. You expect the instructor to deliver as an MCI. You're headed to Belize and you have a bad shoulder. That's kind of your secret. It's the thing that you don't really want to tell anybody. You don't know that as the instructor. You got to figure out a way to get it out of them. So I want you to fill out this chart. And what I'm gonna do is ask for a volunteer, um, somebody that can kind of walk me through how they would do it. I know there's not all the information in the world, right, to go through this, um, but um, fill in the details or figure out what you would say or how you would figure out the details that are missing, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna progress us to this slide. And so you should see this now on Pear Deck, but on the slide, I'm gonna move us to, so you can see the actual question here. So if you have both up on the Zoom, you should be seeing the student scenario and on the Pear Deck, you should be seeing the presentation. So I'm gonna give you three minutes, 6.50 my time till 6.53. Just to kind of walk through this piece and um, enter in some information. How would you define what the student really wants? How would you measure what they're doing? How would you analyze it? And then what are some things you'd do? How would you improve? What would your lesson plan look like for this student? What are some things you'd keep in mind? So if you want to share, um, comment to Phil and he'd be able to unmute you.
and you can have a share. And we'll give you two more minutes. Actually, I'm going to give you to 6.55. Um, we'll probably only be able to do two of these. So um, really think through it. Um, and uh, we'll come back in four minutes, 6.55. Fifty-three. Bill, do we have any volunteers? Um, ask them to raise their hand, Jeff. Somebody yeah. raise, volunteer, raise their hand, and we'll. If someone wants to volunteer to interact with Jeff directly, uh, raise your hand, and I will enable your audio, and you can talk directly with Jeff. Jeff on this particular issue? Sure, yeah. I've got no video of uh, Jeff right now for some reason, as long as you can hear me. I think you're breaking up there a little bit, Allard. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I just lost the video on the, uh, on the Zoom side, but I can oh, see okay. the, uh, the pair deck. So I guess for the, uh, the defined phase there, You'd uh, probably start with something along the lines of uh, what they what they want to do today and and why. Um, find out what they what they can do right now, and uh, ask them what they think is preventing them from getting there from where they're at right now. They they may share the uh, the shoulder scenario at that point. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think uh, for this particular student? What what do you think they would say? You have a, you know, I mean, we've all run into people that are kind of prideful and, you know, I fly fish. I don't, I don't, I don't really need a lesson, but, you know, come in and how, how do you handle that? What, what are, what are some ways that you'd, uh, what do you think they'd say when I said, hey, Allard, I, you know, I'm here. I want to, um, what do you mean? I just, I want to learn to cast better. Do you have a follow-up question or something you might ask him? Somehow he got muted, Jeff. I'm oh. trying to unmute him here, but... Uh... Sorry, Alan. Is he muted on his end? Huh. Not working. Oh. Okay, well... We can keep moving, Phil, and if you figure out a way to get him back, we can do that. 
So I, I think where he was going is good, right? You're just asking questions. It's what do you want to learn? Um, and for to me, for this student, um, I, I think you know, there's even though they're there and they're probably even paying you. Sometimes I've, I've had students that I think have got a little bit of an edge. Um, and so I think it's it's good to get into some details about what they're wanting to do. And sometimes you may not get fully to that defined phase. Um, for the measure piece, um, again, I think on this one, I'd probably try to be a little bit sly in how I actually measure it. Just would get the sense probably from the student that um, they're, you know, might be a little bit skeptical. The shoulder piece though, I throw that in here because a lot of times people that, you know, I, at least I've found this, you know, they're coming to you, um, and maybe they do have a little bit of pride or maybe they don't want to mention some kind of a weakness or an issue, a shoulder issue or something. Um, I think to me, it's something you're going to have to look for and you may not even get them to necessarily say that, but, and I know we often, all of us probably ask, do you have any injuries, anything that would impede, um, but we know how that goes. So I think it's watching, it's being very mindful of the student and watch if they start favoring that shoulder, if they start casting a certain way. Um, and use that, right? I'm a big believer in casting and, and teaching a student based on their biomechanics and how they move. And I will often ask, um, I'm going to change my camera here. Again, get back to my regular background. I will um, often ask a student to do other movements, right? One of my favorites is, you know, how, you, is how they rotate their shoulder and you know, thumb pointed forward and see how far you can bring it back until it starts rotating. Um, you know, if you can do arm circles, you know, simple movements that um, you know, show a lot about their flexibility and their mobility. I, for me, years ago, um, I had an IT band issue. Um, so I'm a runner and, and um, had an IT band issue. And I remember my first time with this physical therapist that I went in to see, um, He's like starts asking me all kinds of different things, right? And and starts um, asking me if I'm doing any strength training, and then starts doing all this mobility work, and um, you know starts looking at my flexibility in my ankles and my knees and my hips and all of that kind of stuff. And we finally found out the IT problem in my knee actually came from weak glutes, right? And I needed to do more squats and strength training. And I think that often we can kind of find those things too um, as casting instructors as you're watching a student and maybe they have a little bit of a, they're, you know, favoring um, uh, shoulder or they're trying to push a little bit harder so that they don't get that twinge of pain in the shoulder watching that so that you can help them cast in a different way instead of casting, you know, over the top of the shoulder or something like that, that we're rotating more in the hips in that casting circle. So anyway, that's define, measure, um, analyze, watching. Um, and then I think the, the improved phase here um, is really just kind of being uh, aware of your student and their body language. To me, if I have a student that's, um, you know, is, is, uh, is hiring me, so there's some receptivity to me um, teaching, but maybe is still got a little bit of, a, of something going on and, um, you know, not being fully receptive to everything, smaller suggestions but really looking for a quick win. What's something that I can do that's gonna impress them and gain their trust super quickly? Um, and for me, not having the attitude, well, you should just trust me because I'm a CI instructor, but it's more about um, how, do I, how do I gain their trust quickly? Um, and sometimes for a student like this, while I don't often like to do it, showing what you can do, right? Um, in a very non-confrontational uh, way, I think can actually be a win. Um, I know there's been a few times for me um, as an instructor, especially when I was very young and in, early, in my early 20s and I have a, um, a student that would come to me that would maybe be in their 50s or 60s that was kind of wondering, right, if I threw out a, you know, 105 foot cast, not showing off, just kind of nonchalantly, uh, often it would gain a, a measure of respect. And so I think there's different ways to make sure that we are communicating with the student. Phil, I want to do a quick time check. We're at seven o'clock. Um, okay. Are we done at seven, or do we have? Oh no, we've got we've got uh, two hours, Jeff. So, okay, cool. Uh, so we can continue as long as we can stand, right. as long as you can stand it. Yep. So this definitely won't take two hours. This is meant to be kind of a quick hit. Um, we'll probably go for about another five to ten minutes on this topic, and then open it up to any uh, if we can get any questions that might come through. So I want to do one more student scenario. Um, and uh, so student scenario number two, uh, let me back 
out here. Student scenario number two, you're a 30 something woman from Boston with a growing career. You had to prove to the guys you can do anything they can. Growing up, you fished with your dad and have been fly fishing since you're 13. And of course, you can cast. You're just looking to get a little more distance. You're heading to Montana to fish the Madison. <clears throat> Secretly, you really want to cast the full fly line. So again, second student, I'm going to give you this defined measure piece and show you again the student scenario. So again, I'm going to give five minutes till 7.07. So define piece, I'm looking for what questions would you ask? And how would you go about some of those questions? The measure piece is what would you measure if that's what they're wanting to do? And again, same thing, Phil, somebody wants to Volunteer. If anybody wants to uh, to volunteer to interact with Jeff on this, just raise your hand, and I'll enable your I'll enable your audio. My original intent was actually for this to be a little bit shorter. I kind of go in, my, in things like this that are online that are kind of tutorial webinar. I kind of go with the uh, church sermon model where 20 minutes is about right. Right. <laughs> Start going maybe much longer than that and people fall asleep. So hopefully nobody's falling asleep. All right. Um, Pete we'll has give you a couple more up. minutes let here. Me, and let me okay. allow Pete to talk. Uh, Pete, somehow for some reason. Yes, how are you? Are you there, Pete? Okay. Oh, uh, there we go. I'm speaking. Are you there? Can you hear me? All right, Pete. Here. Yes. yes. Yes, I can hear you, Pete. How are you, Pete? Okay, I might start out by saying. Good. So I might start yeah. out by saying. Great. Go oh, ahead. How did you, uh, the, uh, you uh, kind of go through this? That the NHL season got started. Are, are you receiving me? Uh oh, you're... yes, no, yes. I am. Hello? Yes. Uh, Pete, this. <laughs> okay, what I might. I would start out by saying. Um, it's too bad the NHL season got cut off when the Bruins were in first place overall. What do you think about that? <laughs> Any, anybody hear that? It's good. Yes, yeah, I did. yeah, for sure. And then, and then I might say, and then I might say, so you're heading out to fish the Madison. Uh, what, what are your expectations out there and, and what do you think you need to, to learn? And hopefully she might volunteer that she yeah. wants to get a little Good. more distance and then we would go from there. And I, I might, I might yeah. ask, uh, why do you think distance is important on the Madison? Things like that. Yeah, there you go. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's great, and I, you know, obviously we've all kind of done this, and it's tough to see it. Uh, the next time I do this, I may add in, uh, I should add in a video of a student casting, so that we could go a little bit more through the analyze piece. Um, and we could do that in a future one if we wanted to, Phil. But I think um, I think you're spot on. A little bit of humor relating to the student, and then I love the uh, the question of, well, why do you think you're going to need to cast that far? Um, and you know, maybe there's a legitimate reason, or maybe there's a misunderstanding, or Right? I don't know. So maybe there's a fun casting competition she has with her friends on the, on the bank of the river or something. Good. 
What would you measure? Yeah, and then I, and, you know, you is might there go. anything specific? Um, I think I would just measure her uh, basic pickup lay down um, uh, yeah. and some false casting, see how much line she can carry. And uh, once I realize, you know, how much line she's carrying successfully with good loops, then I would sort of have a realistic expectation of where she can go as far as improving her distance goes. Yeah. Um, and then measure and then measure some distance. Yeah. Yeah, I love I love measuring the pickup and lay down. I think um, especially the pickup piece, right? I think um, you know, the ability to pick up line from the water and and uh, especially if she's gonna be fishing from a boat and maybe at a little bit of distance or wants to do that a little bit. Uh, I love that. That's great. What else do you have? Um, so once, uh, you know, I thought that if I felt her expectations were reasonable and uh, I had a, a bit of an idea of where she was now, I would uh, maybe ask her, uh, she's an experienced fly fisher person, so I might say, what, uh, what do you see here holding you back uh, from getting a little more distance? What kinds of things do you think help improve your distance? Um, should we be working on fundamentals or should we, should we be working on advanced techniques like hauling? And let her answer those questions. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's great. I love that too. Probing right. a little bit and find out what they know and understanding understanding of casting and and um you know i think uh you know again you find out you know well uh, uh you know yeah um understanding you know you might find out something that maybe they have a belief on that that isn't necessarily true when it comes to casting and being able to also uh, to, to correct some of those things i know i've you know uh, had that happen a number of times i think we're students where you know, a misunderstanding about the forward cast and the back cast and power between each one of them and that maybe one of them should be greater than another and they share that as a belief and yeah, that's great. Good. All right. Good. What else? Why don't we, why don't we move on there? Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Peter, I'm going to mute you for your input. I appreciate your uh, interaction. Great. Okay, um, I'll, well, let's go through one more. We've got a little bit of time. We'll do this one and we'll just do some questions. So we'll end on this. So if I take you back to the pair deck, we'll do one more, which is student three. School teacher on a budget from Washington and save your money for this trip. You're afraid to say too much because you think it might cost you another lesson. You're looking to improve um, how quickly you can deliver a fly. So he's headed to the Bahamas on a budget. Um, secret, kind of going through a divorce. Doesn't have a lot of money. Tell me what this conversation might look like. I'm going to take you progress it to here. All right. Once again, uh, if you want to interact with Jeff on this, raise your hand, and I will. Uh, I'll enable your audio. So let's go to seven thirteen, my time. We'll, uh, three minutes, and then we'll do some Q&A. Oh, we got lots of hands up. We got uh, Eric, Alan. Her right. hands got her up. I'm not going to let her talk. 
You pick. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's go with uh, Eric Callow. So Eric, I'm going to enable your video. Okay, you're uh, Eric. You're uh, you're live. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, sir. Great. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to turn on my video, but uh, on the screen. Uh, well, right. the first thing I'd want to do is, uh, is find out more about uh, uh, his casting and just ask him, uh, him to describe uh, how long he's been casting, how he learned, and uh, get him to explain to me uh, so that I might understand, you know, the degree to which he is self-taught. And uh, that to me is really uh, pretty uh, telling in terms of uh, potential uh, habits that you might have to deal with. Uh, I'm, I'm inferring from the, uh, the, the student three description that uh, he wants to do this quickly or will want to do this quickly. He doesn't have money for a lot of lessons. Uh, uh, Personally, I'm, I'm not professional. I, I ask people to make a donation to the FFI if I give them a lesson. And uh, so I don't make a big issue of that. But I guess my question to you uh, is, wouldn't we want to simply observe uh, this, this uh, student's uh, casting so that we can make our own assessment on, on where, where he's at and what what stage uh, we need to address. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think these scenarios are just, um, you know, what would you be looking for and how would you kind of structure the lesson? So totally you'd be looking. And I think the one thing on this, so if you were uh, an instructor that was looking to be paid, I think the one thing I was kind of thinking about on this one specifically is just how you would structure the lesson plan. So if I think back to, um, to this, right? If I was going to fill this out for this student, um, what I may do is put together some of my analysis, right? Put together an improve phase where I give them some things to do. And maybe in just one lesson or two lessons, talk about what I'm seeing, give them the notes, show them a few practice techniques, give them those notes, and then let them kind of self-guide it. So if they can't meet with me, um, right? At least give them what you're seeing and then allow them. So, um, you know, rather than guiding them through it over the next three or four lessons, maybe you just kind of help them work on it and that way they can work on their own. And then maybe you meet, you know, where you would meet every week uh, or every two weeks or every month or whatever it is. Maybe instead you meet, you know, less, less often. And so for me, this one was more about how would you structure it to be kind of sensitive to the students, um, you know, financial situation, but still help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but totally observe it, uh, measure. So what would you, um, if they're heading to the Bahamas, what's something that you would measure as you're watching their cast? Well, uh, I, I want him to uh, be able to uh, load the rod quickly and uh, get the line accelerated on uh, on his pickup and into the back cast uh, so that he's in a position to deliver the line with uh, one or two false casts. I mean, okay. that's, that's the game in bone fishing. And okay. uh, so uh, I want to see that he has uh, a sound enough fundamental uh, casting stroke uh, to accelerate the fly line along a, a trajectory. Okay, great. Yeah. So if I were thinking about measuring that, um, could you measure something like the number of false casts it takes to land a fly at a target at 60 feet? Or what's, what's something else that you might actually measure that helps them know that they're, they're improving? I actually want to measure his, uh, his casting arc. And uh, because we know from experience that nine times out of 10, it's too too wide and uh, you know perhaps it would be helpful to actually show them know your your casting arc is a full uh, 90 degrees and it needs to be <laughs> like half of that <laughs> or uh, you know 
something like that. You could actually get down to the nitty gritty of, uh, of his, uh, his foundation casting stroke. Okay. So, uh, okay, we won't go into this in too much detail, but if you have a student that's trying to cast fast, the faster you cast or you've been in the rod deeper, is your casting arc increasing or decreasing? Um, well, it tends to, uh, hmm. I would say as I start, uh, it's going to have to increase, and uh, so I want him to uh, to expand it to deal with the increased yeah. load and the increased bending of the rod. Totally, yeah, totally. And you know, it might be a little bit of a tougher thing to measure, but I think um, you know, especially if you're using video analysis, if you think about uh, coach's eye again, you can take a video on coach's eye. You can actually put. Um, you know, marks uh, on the video and measure the degrees uh, within mm -hmm. coach's eye. And so you take a video at the beginning and a video at the end and kind of, and, and show those. So uh, we should probably do a coach's eye one of these. But anyway, that's great. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Okay. All right. Let's move on. All right. Well, with that, I don't have uh, much else, Phil. Um, I think we're pretty much done. If there's any questions or comments or anything like that, um, well, we've, we've had a number of questions throughout the presentation and I've answered them uh, okay. uh, to, to the best of my ability. Uh, uh, there, there was some interest in, in uh, specifically from Ted Warren on, he was asking, uh, you, he'd like you to comment on the multiple points on that cell. And I think he was talking about your your spreadsheet there. So what, put, pull, put that spreadsheet back up. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is, yeah. So Ted, uh, so Ted, uh, let me, Ted, I will enable your, vi uh, your audio and, uh, and you can ask, uh, uh, Jeff directly here. So I can find, here you go. All right, Jeff, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're clear to talk. I mean, uh, Ted, you're clear to talk. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> There's one cell you had that started with a phrase of single handed casting. Uh, could you, Go through the other points on that cell. Single-handed. <clears throat> it may have been 35 to 40, somewhere in there. Oh, on a slide or a cell? Yeah. Yes, on a so slide. On a slide. Let me go back. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, I just didn't have time to um, uh, read those and uh, okay. just run through those real quick. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Uh, and we'll send this out too. Um, so the single hand, um, don't forget the basics. So I think often when we have students, especially advanced students that are coming in, um, right, they're often using the hall as a crutch. And <laughs> I think many of them forget how to cast single handed. And so I often will have a student that especially is an extremely, you know, powerful caster um, that is really using the hauling hand. I feel they often overemphasize the hauling hand. And so I will actually take away the hauling hand and have them go back to rod hand only and do that, right? Show me how much power you can create. Show me distance you can create. Show me what you can do, control you can make. Really making sure that we get the foundation of the cast back to where it is and then add the hull. Um, I, I think, um, you know, and it, you know, kudos to a lot of, uh, you know, advanced casters that can really make that hauling hand work for them. But instead of it being an ad, it often ends up being a crutch. And I, and sometimes I see, you know, you'll see small casting errors get accentuated with that hull also. So um, going back to the foundations is the single hand piece. 
um, maximizing the hall. So this is where I'm really having students, and if you can see in the video, um, really reaching. And um, what I'm looking for here, I believe personally, a longer hall is an easier, easier cast. Um, I don't like personally people trying to match necessarily the hall with a stroke or trying to do very short halls. Well, you can, I get that. I think it's very hard to time a short hall. And so a longer hall is better. Plus it's just gonna maximize the power. So I'll have the student try to reach right to that first guide, to, the, to that first stripper guide, um, get up as high as they can, maximizing the length of the hall and same thing um, on the other end, right? The, um, as they're making their hall coming down to their side. So making sure we're getting good separation, clean separation between the two things. So that's okay, very good. Uh -huh. um, with <coughs> power, we talked about max carry is carrying as much line as you can. Again, often these are for distance or for power or for efficiency, but the max carry isn't, not that I'm, you know, I can carry 92 whatever feet of line. I'm not going to do that fishing. The key is, um, making it easier to control less line. So I think having a student go from, you know, if they can carry 30 feet of line and we can get them to carry 35 feet of line then in the fishing situation, when they're only carrying 25 feet of line, they're just gonna have far more control over it. So it's actually a technique where we're working on them carrying as much line as possible. Um, the pick up carry shoot is a technique where I have the student lay 10 feet of line out in front of them. They'll pick the line up, make a couple of false casts, and shoot it. You know, maybe they'll shoot from 10 feet, they'll go to 15 feet. Pick up 15 feet of line, make a few false casts, shoot. Maybe it'll shoot to 20 feet. Pick up 20 feet, carry, shoot. Pick up that. And they're progressively lengthening that. So it's working on three things, right? It's working on the pickup, it's working on the amount of line they can carry, and the line they can shoot. It's a true kind of fishing application and putting everything together. Pick up, carry, <coughs> shoot. And how much a distance is reasonable to shoot? as a percentage of your pickup? Should you be able to shoot? Yeah, that's a great know, 25 question. Yeah. I think, uh, I think 25 to 50%, depending on the amount of line, the weight of the line, um, you know, some other factors I think is, is very reasonable, right? If you're carrying 30 feet of line to shoot to 45 is not unreasonable at all and, and could actually be further than that. Obviously, if you're carrying less and have less weight out of the tip, you might, you know, yeah. It's a point of diminishing return, but I think for most fishable distances, 25 to 50 percent is, is very reasonable. Okay. Um, accuracy and alignment, um, you know, this to me is, uh, is lining up the foot, the shoulder, the hand. Um, true For true accuracy, right, we're looking for alignment. I think I've, you know, often to me and I find students with, you know, rod hand out here, and it's that classic kind of Joan Wolf scenario of lining things up and getting all the points to kind of connect. And so, you know, making sure that we're lining up and we're trying to get true accuracy. Um, when and what to watch. So to me, this is how to turn the head. Um, one of the things, you know, I think we all, everybody does this, right? That you go to make your back cast and we tell the student to look at the back cast and as they're making the back cast, they turn their head and what happens? everything rotates, right? So we want them to do this straight back. And instead they go to look and they do this. And then we rotate their back cast. So to me, this is about, and this can be for a variety of situations, but for this specific one, they're gonna make a back cast. I want them to turn and look at the cast after they stop. Stop, turn, and look, right? Stop, turn, and look. Okay. That way, even if they do rotate their body, at that point, the loop's already formed and it's not gonna matter. So that's the win and what to watch for. Do you have an opinion about uh, uh, Lefty Cray? He keeps that hand down or offside uh, at a little side angle and really can reach far back doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that to me gets very much into the next one, which is how do you find your style? And um, I, um, <laughs> I know that we're all CIs and, and so, you know, I know the, the, the FFI glossary uh, pretty well, but to me, style is, I'm going to define style as anything you do that doesn't affect the desired outcome of your cast. So if you're trying to make a 30 foot straight line cast, anything you do that doesn't affect that 30 foot straight line cast is style. Right? Anything else would need to be substance. Because if I can make a 30-foot straight line cast or a 40-foot straight line cast, 
if I can get that done, anything else is style because it didn't affect the desired outcome. It didn't affect my substance. So on the lefty cray piece, man, if you're cast in sidearm, great. I, I mean, yeah, I do it. Everybody does it. To me, those are those are all style things. There is no there is no right way to make a cast, right? There might be a more efficient way for you to make a cast. There might be a better way to teach casting so the student can see the loop. Um, there might be a way that's going to preserve your wrist and things like that over time. But yeah, whether you're, you know, your lefty or your Doug Swisher or your uh, whoever doing different styles. Um, yeah, to me, it's about the desired outcome. What would you say to a student on distance cast where, you know, you make that hard final cast and the loop just uh, opens up, uh, just becomes a balloon? Totally. And that's where I'd go back to this less power piece. I think for me, uh, especially on most distance students, you know, we get them to carry that 55, 60 feet of line somewhere in there, which is a really good distance. And then they try to hit it in that last cast. And everybody always says, you know, should have shot the one previous, right? Should have let the one, yeah. one before go. Um, and so to me, it, it truly is that. It's getting the student to just be able to easily carry 55, 60 feet of line. And instead of adding additional power, just releasing. If you're carrying that much line, you have enough energy to just kind of let it go. And then starting to work on the timing of when you apply the power in the cast. Um, yeah, I, so many students, they have it coming forward and they just, to me, you, it's, um, I'll say this and I may get in trouble for this, I think it's impossible to overpower a rod. I think it's very possible to properly uh, apply, or it's very difficult to properly apply a lot of power, let me say it that way, right? So it's just the students being able to control it and apply the power at the right time in the cast. I often have um, uh, students and fishing friends when they want to try to cast all the way across the stream and make a mess of it. I recommend that um, a lot of times changing position so that you have a shorter cast is a lot better solution than trying to increase your cast 50 percent. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, the last one is increasing stroke length here. Um, so I'll just cover on that and then we can open it up to any more questions. But increasing stroke length is just that, right? It's how do I get more length in my cast? And um, to me, this comes in again to that kind of biomechanics piece. So, um, you know, that kind of back to your to your comment about the style piece. Um, you know, one of the things that I that I and I do this probably in every single lesson. You know, we often show this uh, this thumb on top grip. Might be kind of hard to see, but the thumb on top, um, right? That's the classic grip. Great. Um, the one thing about that is I'm making my back cast is, you know, it definitely creates a body block. Even, you know, for me, I've been doing this stroke for a lot of years. And about this point is where, you know, I can't move much further. Um, and one of the things, you know, as we talk about increasing your stroke length, if you just go from thumb on top to key grip, so going from thumb forward to palm forward, here coming back and trying to come straight back, I can feel my shoulder bind, right? Here palm forward coming straight back. And if you do this, nobody can see you doing it, right? So you come straight back. I've got way more, way more range of motion. So I like to find those ways, one, to get, to get students to have additional stroke length. It can also be stance and rocking in your stance. Um, and it can just be, how do you increase the stroke length? Um, but we could do a whole other session right on biomechanics and teaching the biomechanics. And, and I think those are, critical components as well. Uh, would it be correct to assume that you use the six step method in analyzing and correcting problems? Sure, I, absolutely. I, I think, um, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, for sure, knowing the connection between, you know, what the fly line is doing to the rod, to the hand, and then back up, absolutely elemental to pretty much everything we do, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, yeah you bet. Bill, any others? Um, well, there's lots of there's been lots of uh, questions I'm answering as we go through. Okay. Taking uh, uh, been a lot of good been a lot of good uh, chat coming in. And uh, uh, is there anybody else who wants to ask ask Jeff a question directly? 
just ra raise your hand and uh, you know, we, we, we can't, you know, we, we can't go on all night here, but uh, if somebody else wants yeah, to ask Jeff a will. question directly, you just raise your hand and I'll enable your audio. Yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, Derman Sox has got his hand up. I'm going to enable his. Uh... Hey, Derman, oh, you man. know what? Derman? It's like he's still muted. I think Wait Ted's not, and Ted needs to be muted, and Derman's not. Um... Hmm. Hello, hello. Hey, Derman. How are you? Hey, there you are. Can you hear me now? Yep. I can. Good to talk to you again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Long time no see. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> one of my um, one of my pet peeves is um, casters who want to start um, uh, changing the angle of the rod too early. So I want to save rotation until right at the very end of the cast. But the traditional cast that most uh, most instructors teach starts with that kind of a hatchet chop with the uh, with a locked wrist and that immediately starts changing the angle of the rod changing the angle of the rod is your only real source for speed and also if you use that hatchet chop with a locked wrist you are actually adding a foot of length to the effective length of your rod the length of your forearm and so when you start changing that angle of the rod with what now your nine foot rod has become a 10 foot rod you can't help but go too fast at the beginning of the cast and uh, i think that's that's one of my issues with a lot of casting techniques that uh, other teachers use did you hear me yeah okay <laughs> Comment, reactions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think delayed rotation, especially on um, you know distance cast, is absolutely elemental. To your point, it needs to be as far out to the end as possible um, for the effective rotation uh, to occur. And totally agree with you that you know the longer that you can wait, um, the better off you are. And and for me, again, I this is just you know a technique that I have used. But I think over accentuating the pieces, right? Um, it's kind of like when somebody is creeping, tell them instead of to creep, actually drift, right? Do the exact opposite thing. And so to me, when I think about this one, it's actually like going through this dragging phase all the way forward until they run out of arms. I'll show it here. Dragging forward until you almost run out of arm to where you're forced to rotate. To your point, I think if you start up in this position and the rod's already kind of cocked, it's really easy to rotate here. But just for teaching purposes, if I... If I have them start with the rod low and bring it forward until they run out of arm, right? And they have to rotate, it's gonna delay that rotation to the very end. And so I'll do that. The other one that I love on this is uh, definitely is, um, uh, is again, the coach's eye is the video analysis. Love to be able to take this kind of a teaching technique where we have them drag all the way through and then run out of arm and they have to rotate at the end combine that with okay. the video to be able to show what they're doing, right? That they're actually starting to rotate early and then pushing into the cast. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and then can highlight that, right? Just put in lines where they're starting to rotate on coach's eye. And, and yeah, that's a, that's a great one. Okay. It's great. Thanks, Dermot. Mm -hmm. I owe you an email too. I'll get there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good chat. Well, Phil, that's about all I have. I, we can probably end it there. Um, I think everybody's got my email. If you have any questions or comments, um, I appreciate this. This is super fun for me. Love doing it. And uh, if we want to set up any future ones, I'd love to, well, love to well, do more. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we, we appreciate you taking the time to do this. And uh, it, it's been it's very helpful based on the question and answers that I've seen in the, in the chats that I've gotten. You know, everybody wants to see it again. And I told them it, it was it was recorded and it will eventually show up on the uh, on the website um, okay I think in the I think in the learning center but I'm not sure exactly where it's going to show up but you know this session will be on the website eventually great that sounds good
Yeah. All right. So for those of you, Jeff, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the people to do a poll uh, from my end. So uh, okay. you know, uh, you you can you can bail if you want, or I'm just gonna throw the poll up. Oop. I'm not gonna throw the poll. Well, we'll launch the poll. <laughs> that isn't gonna work. All right. So we didn't get the we didn't get the poll into <laughs> in here. Uh, so we're not going to do the poll. So <laughs> for some reason, it's not there. I don't. I, I don't know why. Uh, Marianne and I'll sort that out later. But we're we've uh, we've missed an opportunity to uh, just get some basic questions answered, uh, which we wanted to do. But all right. So thanks everybody. Thank, yep. Thanks, Jeff. It was you great. See ya. Yeah. Marianne, stay here. I'll uh, I'll enable you, and we can we can chit chat a minute. Can I chit chat? Yeah, you're you're welcome to stay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see you, everybody. All right, thanks, Jeff. Okay. I'm gonna end, I'm gonna bring Marianne over, and we'll we'll chat for a minute. That was fun. Yeah, that was good. Thank you. Uh, all right, Marianne, you're uh, Marianne, you're rowing a boat. You're muted. Okay, I don't see her either, so. You don't, I do. You see Marianne? I do. Okay. She's looking well. I just promoted her to panelist, so what do we got here? Panelist. Marianne's muted, so I've unmuted her. Spotlight video. There she is. Still muted. You're still muted, Marianne. Let me. Unmute. There you go. You're hot. I'm hot. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I mean that. I mean your mic's hot. Your mic's hot. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't interpret it. I didn't inter interpret it any other way because I've never been told that, by the way, Phil. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, you don't worry all about right. that at all. So, okay. but Jeff, that was great. Yeah, no, I think it was good. I don't know why the poll's not there. Uh, I asked well, we, if you wanted to put it on there, just like it was on the practice session, but it clearly wasn't there, so. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is, I'll probably just very quickly do some of the questions in um, MailChimp tonight and send it out, because I can do an email straight out of Eventbrite and send it to everybody. Okay. So how many, so how many people did we end up having? About 40? At, at, we had, uh, at, 8.45, we had 55 people, 55 okay, cool. uh, attendees. It slowly dribbled off. Uh, at 9.30, we were down to 43. There's still 21 up, so there's there's a number of people up still uh, uh, watching. Um, oh, well. <laughs> well. Okay. Lucky, <laughs> lucky, 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 yeah. lucky, lucky I'm out of my PJs. Yeah. <laughs> probably think, stop yeah, recording, yeah, Bill. Still here, too. Yeah, you should probably stop recording. Yeah, yeah, we should do that. Um, I'm going to. Uh, I'm trying to. For all of you that are still listening, all the attendees, you guys can all log off. We're just going to do a little 
uh, continuing education committee business here. So if, if you if y'all can uh, y'all can log off, or I will I'll re I'll I'll remove you, but. Can you stop the recording, Phil, or is that linked to the meeting ending uh, and stopping? I don't, it doesn't look like it's. It's recording on like, my end. It doesn't look like it's recording anymore. Mine says recording. It does it. Mine is yours, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah.